move on. Welcome back to Holding Solo. My name is Adam Smith, and today, very excited to continue the showcase for Resident Evil, the board game from Steamforge Games. What better game to be playing inside the month of October than this? This is the Kickstarter edition. The retail is coming around the same time frame that this video launches. Now, this video, unlike my previous unboxing video for this one, if you haven't seen the unboxing, the link's in the top right-hand corner, this video will focus on how to set up the campaign. I'll be playing multi-handed solo. I'll be controlling two characters. You're going to see all the steps to set up inside this video as well as the steps to get the scenario set up to dive us right into the gameplay to show you how this thing flows and operates again all to help you make an informed decision on whether or not this is for you without further ado let's get started the first thing we need to do is choose our character. We can play true solo, controlling just one character, but I'm going to choose to play multi-handed solo. So I'm going to control two characters. Instead of just picking them, I'm going to let fate decide we're going to roll a die. This will be one, two, three, and four. Fives and sixes will be re-rolled. Let's see what we get off the hop here. We got a two. That's going to be Jill. And next up is going to be a five. We need to re-roll that or re-roll it. We got a two. So that is going to be where Jill's position was again. Let's continue rolling until we get a one, three, or a four. And there is a three. So it's it's going to be Jill and Rebecca. Now that I know which characters I'm controlling, I've grabbed the miniatures corresponding to each of the character cards. Both of the characters now receive a health track. We're placing that to the right of the character card. It is broken into five sections from fine to danger. The health tracker marker is going to be placed in the fine position. Now at this point, each of the characters is going to take their starting equipment. You'll know exactly what starting equipment they get based on the far left-hand side of each of the character cards. In order to find the items more easily for each of the characters, find the deck of cards that has an S on the back. So for Jill, she has a knife, first aid spray, and a handgun. The guns of the game come with a dial, so if you have a handgun, find the handgun ammo dial. Also set it to the amount of bullets that are in the top right-hand corner of the card. You get to start with this, 15 in this case. Next, each of the characters is going to take a number of kerosene tokens, three in this case for Jill, as she has a three in the top right icon on her character card. Rebecca here has been set up in the same manner on the opposite side. There are some differences to take note of. First off, she doesn't have a knife. She has an additional first aid spray. And second off, she has an additional kerosene token here. Now let's shift our attention over to supporting characters. In addition to the four main characters, we have these four here. You'll know they're supportive as they have reserve only in the top right-hand corner. We're now going to place Brad face up in the character reserve. We're going to shuffle the rest of the remaining support characters with the other main characters that aren't being used. It's going to create a survivor deck. We're going to place that deck face down on the corresponding slot on the dashboard. Here's a look at the campaign dashboard. You're going to see that survivor deck underneath of Brad who's revealed on the very top of it. Now we're going to focus our attention on filling out the campaign dashboard. The first thing we have here is the danger dial. You're going to see it set to S. That is the starting position. Now this next step of setup is very important to do through a number of decks to ensure that certain cards are not part of the campaign at the very beginning. You're going to go through the narrative deck, encounter deck, item A and B decks, mission and tension decks to remove a number of cards that have icons similar to this in the bottom portion of the card. You're going to find square icons, circle, triangles, which are right side up and upside down, diamonds. If you see any of those icons whatsoever, an example of one would be right here, you're going to remove those cards from each of those decks. So just moments ago, I showed you the narrative deck and the example of one of the icons there. Here's an example with the item A deck and the icon you can see in the bottom right hand corner being a triangle. So again, make sure you go through each of those decks, the narrative, encounter, item A, item B, mission, and tension decks, and get rid of all of those cards with those icons. Once those cards are removed, you're going to go ahead and take the remaining cards. You're going to shuffle each of the decks and place them on the dashboard. I've got the campaign dashboard partially done. We don't know what scenario we're heading into just yet, and that can actually change some of the decks. So for now, I've got the narrative deck here, again, with the icons discussed and inside the rulebook removed from that deck. We have the mission cards right here. This is the survivor deck that we had set up earlier in the video that was sitting underneath of Brad here. I just moved it down to this slot. We're going to have expiration cards figured out once we get a little bit further along. For now, they're left out of the equation. And then up to the very top, we have the encounter deck, again, a similar situation there, removing cards based on the icons depicted in the rule book. Here we have the tension deck. I've got every single card for the tension deck so far, but that is going to certainly change based on the scenario we're playing. Same thing for the item decks, although I have one item deck here. Item deck A is situated. I've removed all the icons from that deck in the bottom right hand corner, but there might be changes to that deck as well once we select a scenario. Now we're going to set up the C deck. The C deck is comprised of a number of cards with stars in the bottom right hand corner. 
essentially you're going to want to go through them and make sure that all the stars of a similar quantity are in piles and then you're going to shuffle each individual pile again face down so you don't know what's going on you'll place the four star pile at the bottom then three stars on top then two stars and then one stars again all these facing down that will make your item c deck and then you do not shuffle the entirety of the deck once it's been compiled the campaign dashboard's about 50% set up. Now we need to focus on the mansion map and the scenario we're going to play. For those familiar with Resident Evil 1, you'll know full well that you stumble upon a mansion, and this is where we set up the mansion map. We're simply going to do exactly as it states on page 28 of the rulebook. We're going to be placing different rooms around this main hall. Also, there'll be some locked areas as well. For those of you that are familiar with Resident Evil 1, you walk into the main hall of the mansion and from there begin to explore into different parts of the mansion and not everything is accessible from the start. So we have Crypts B locked here and Crypts A locked here, but we have other areas in the mansion to explore. If there's ever new scenario cards to be added, which there is in the deck off screen, they'll be added in connection to the numbers. You'll see the ones that I've already slotted in, match numbers and arrows. Now, as you complete scenarios in the game, it might tell you to add another scenario card to this layout. And in most cases, you'll be connecting to one that you've just completed and you'll be doing so by making sure the numbers line up. Also, if that card comes in with a lock side, it begins locked and lock scenarios usually require something to be found like a key, for instance, in order for them to be unlocked. Each of those scenario cards will have the requirements of what's necessary to unlock them on the card. And once you find those, then you're able to unlock that scenario and you'll want to continue journeying through the mansion. The overall goal for the players and characters involved is to find the helipad scenario. Once you've done this and you've completed it, you successfully survive the campaign. So we have four options or four scenarios to choose between and it's worth mentioning that first floor west A is meant to be a beginner's introductory scenario to the campaign. So if you want to start somewhere that's a little bit less than the others, that's going to be the place for you to start. However, if you're experienced with Resident Evil, you might want to jump into a more advanced version of a scenario beyond this one, which is what I'm going to do in this case. I'm going to go to the first floor east A. We now head into the scenario book, find the scenario we've selected, and you'll notice a full layout here, which we can use in order to put everything together. I'll be doing this in just a moment. Also want to mention something very cool about this edition of the game, which I don't believe was part of the prior editions, is the fact it actually shows you how you should set it up on your table in terms of where additional pieces may lay later on. So it's letting us know about two thirds of the table on the left hand side is going to be taken up. We need to leave some space on the right hand side. It also lets you know exactly how many tiles that you'll be getting together and ready to go. And then of course, a number of them will be out from the very beginning, which will populate this green area. All scenarios have an introduction, objectives, and special rules all laid out. We're gonna go over all of these once the whole scenario has been set up. For now, we're gonna to skip to the card deck section. As I mentioned prior, we went through the campaign dashboard about 50 to 60% of the way, but there are changes or potentially additions that come into play based on scenario specific rules. So you wanna make sure that you read those and make the tweaks as necessary. We're gonna do that right now. Now we're told for the item A deck to grab three cards. One of those cards is gonna have a triangle and a number one inside, which is a kerosene container. And then two of the triangle with a number two inside, those are shotgun shells. All three of these are gonna be shuffled into the item A deck. Now to set up the item B deck, we need to find the broken shotgun, stun gun, and old key. I've got them here. We're shuffling these together and we'll place them in slot B in the top right. And now we're told to get the exploration cards, which are specific to the scenario we selected, which is the first floor East A. So I've got those three cards right here, and they're gonna go in a stack on the bottom right portion of the campaign dashboard. Now, as you likely notice, the giant tension deck in the top right-hand corner is gone. That's because our next step is to set that up. There is no specific tension deck changes for this scenario. There will be scenario rules at times where you have to change or add things in the tension deck. Currently, it's gonna be the basic tension deck. So we're gonna go through it as we did with other decks, remove any of the icons in the bottom right-hand corner from that deck, shuffle the entire thing and place it in the slot up top left. The tension deck has been shuffled, placed in the top left-hand corner of the campaign dashboard and just to show you guys the icon in that tension deck as you've seen prior with other decks removed all those cards and nothing specific to this scenario telling us to place any back in the tension deck you're now seeing a bird's eye view of the first floor east a scenario let's go ahead and populate the map 
The scenario is all filled in. We have Jill Valentine down here in the bottom left, and we have Rebecca Chambers up here. We also have a number of doors. The ones that are really key is there's an archway door right here, which is wide open. These other doors are all closed up at the moment. This one right here is a locked door and it's going to require the sword key in order to get through it. We also have a number of tokens of varying levels here from yellow to orange, the most dangerous being red. Orange is still pretty risky though. We have items that can potentially come from the item B deck or the item A deck. We also have a zombie wandering through the hallway here. We have one corpse here and one corpse closer to where Jill Valentine starts. The other corpse is down here next to where Jill starts, and as I mentioned earlier, we have two regular doors here and one door which requires a sword key, all of them leading into the unknown. The introduction states a brisk chill has taken root in the area, chasing down the long corridors through windows that have been smashed in from outside. As if the sight weren't disturbing enough, you detect traces of dried blood on the jagged glass and floor beneath, only slowly washing away with the patter of rain from outside. Despite your sense of trepidation, you can't turn back. Doubtless, you'll find important clues if you explore, and possibly even another way out of the mansion. You'll just have to hope whatever came in through the windows doesn't find you first. The objectives state in this scenario, the characters must find an important item in order to progress. If the item C card for this scenario has been collected and each character is on the same tile, the players can choose to successfully complete the scenario at any time. If there are any enemies on the same tile as the characters when the scenario is completed, you skip step six during the end phase. We're not checking the special rules for the scenario. There are three. The first one is quiet area, and it states if the tension deck runs out during the scenario, shuffle the discard pile and place it face down to refresh the deck. Additionally, if this scenario is successfully completed, skip step two during the end phase. We'll talk more about the end phase in a little bit. The next one is the shotgun trap, another special rule. The shotgun trap special rule tells me to find the shotgun item B card. You'll easily be able to find this by looking for the icon of an upside down triangle with a one in it in the bottom right hand corner as you can see on screen and then place that in the puzzle slot. Then on top of the shotgun in the first puzzle card slot, you're going to place the Suncrest puzzle card face up. So I place that card on top of the shotgun there. A character that's in the same square as the Suncrest token, and that token is currently not visible, but likely will be when we explore a little bit further. You can spend an action to remove the card beneath the Suncrest puzzle card, which is the shotgun, and add it to your inventory. Then you flip the puzzle card face down, and when the card is flipped face down, you place a puzzle locked door card under the door marked as the exit door. In other words, you can't leave. So there's this fun puzzle of you want the shotgun, but if you take it, the door is going to lock on you. You have to solve that in order to get out if you want the shotgun as well. And it's worth mentioning, if you take that shotgun and the exit door is actually open, then the door immediately closes. Now, those that are familiar with Resident Evil 1 know exactly how this puzzle is solved. So this one it tells you as the third special rule, you can disarm the trap. So how do you do this? If the Suncrest puzzle card is face down, meaning you've interacted with it before and you've taken what's underneath of it, the shotgun, and of course that locks the exit door. If a character is in the same space as the Suncrest token, you can spend an action to place the shotgun back. If you do that, the exit door opens. But if you can find the broken shotgun, you can place that there instead and that will ensure the exits open but you also get to keep the real shotgun that works. And that, my friends, is going to wrap up the how to set up video for Resident Evil, the board game from Steamforge Games. I really hope this helps you make an informed decision on the game and stay tuned to the channel by subscribing to find out when the next video drops for gameplay. Really looking forward to doing that with you guys. Now, you might notice a difference when you're setting the game up dependent on which scenario you select from the beginning of your campaign. Of course, that can change the entirety of the structure of the scenario. But one thing to note is that the tile artwork does not matter in terms of which artwork you use because you're going to have multiples of of certain tile shapes and you're able to basically pick which ones you want to connect to create a scenario so your setup for this scenario may look visually different than mine and that's a-ok -okay. that is still within the game rules you have the freedom to create a scenario in terms of how it looks on the artwork as you wish so long as the actual format and structure stays the same now differences will certainly crop up in terms of which characters you've chosen to bring into your campaign will have different loadouts different abilities and also the campaign 
dashboard is going to have changes depending on which of the scenarios you decide to go into first. But hopefully this still helps you to understand how everything gets to the table and gets going. Thank you guys so much for watching. And as always, keep on rolling solo.